now we're going to go into the uh, end of our scientific program for today's meeting with our president's invited lecture. Um, and this is something as a society we introduced a few years ago, um, has been very popular with our members. Um, so without any further ado, I will hand over to our president, Bruce Lascelles, to introduce our final speaker. Um, yeah, it's been a, a fantastic morning. And one of my duties as president has been to invite the speaker for today's conference um, for the president's lecture. And I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Professor Ratan Lal. Ratan is a distinguished university professor of soil science and director of the CFAES Dr. Ratan Lal Carbon Management and Sequestration Center at the, at the Ohio State University, as well as an adjunct professor of the University of Iceland and the Indian Agricultural Research Institute. Ratan's research interests include soil carbon sequestration for food and climate security, conservation agriculture, soil health, principles and practices of soil erosion control, soil structure and carbon dynamics, eco-intensification of agroecosystems, soil restoration, the fate of soil carbon transported by soil erosion, and sustainable management of world soils. Ratan is Editor-in-Chief of Advances in Soil Science and of the Encyclopedia of Soil Sciences. He's authored and co-authored over a thousand referee journal articles and more than 550 book chapters, and has written and edited or co-edited more than 100 books. Ratan has mentored 112 graduate students, 54 postdoctoral researchers, and 181 visiting scholars from around the world. He holds a chair in soil science and goodwill ambassador for sustainability issues for the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture and is a member of the 2021 United Nations Food Security Summit Science Committee and Action Tracks 1 and 3 committees. Ratan's work has been recognised globally. Um, he's a laureate of the GCHERA World Agricultural Prize in 2018, the Glinka World Soil Prize in 2018, the Japan Prize in 2019, the US uh, Awathi IFFCO Prize of India in 2019, the Aral Global Food Innovation Award of Canada in 2020, the World Food Prize in 2020, and the Padma Shri Award in 2021 from the Government of India. Uh, so as I say, absolutely delighted to have you here today, Ratan, and over to you. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bruce Lassell, uh, many other colleagues, uh, Lorna Dawson, Nicole Cole, uh, for inviting me. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. The title that uh, I was given was Returning Some Land to Nature by Producing Enough from Less. Uh, the next slide, please. The Green Revolution, uh, please keep clicking. These are many um, clicks. Uh, so uh, between 1961 and 2020, the global population increased 2.5 times. Over that period, the global cereal production increased 3.3 times. Therefore, the per capita cereal production increased 32% over that time. The next one, please. This was brought about, uh, the next, please keep clicking, cropland area by one and a half billion hectare, grazing land 3.5 billion hectare, Total agricultural land, in fact, more than 5 billion hectares, about 5.2. And in spite of that uh, large area, next slide, please. Uh, we have also tremendous uh, inputs. Between 1961 and 2019, the fertilizer nitrogen increased nine times, phosphorus and potassium five times, tremendous use of pesticides, Irrigated land area increased two and a half times from 140 to almost 370 million hectares at the present. The next one. The next slide, please. Uh, as a result of that, uh, this, there has been a tremendous impact of uh, agricultural activity on the global carbon cycle. Prehistorically, from beginning of the agriculture to about 1750, the carbon emission from the terrestrial biosphere was estimated 320 gigaton. From 1750 to 2019, 255 gigaton. Total, about 575 gigaton from land use and soil management. Compare that with fossil fuel emission from 1750 to 
2019 estimated at 445 gigaton and the global temperature increase has already been more than 1.1 degrees centigrade and these emissions from land use have also tremendous effect on many ecosystem services such as food feed fiber fuel water biota shelter many things the next one please the global soil degradation in addition to the emissions uh, has been a very serious problem the next um, we have um, uh, land area affected by degradation, about one third of the total land area. The forestry land, 47%, crop land, about 18%, uh, 2 billion hectares of degraded lands, and 3.2 billion people affected by soil degradation. Next one, please. We are reaching a concept which is normally applied to extinct plant, extinct animals. Uh, and I think there is a time to think about peak soil, endangered soil, extinct soils, for example. Uh, suitable arable agricultural land area per person is about 0.25 hectare. Many countries have 0 0.05 hectare per capita, and that has created some social problems. Land grab, civil onset, soil refugees, for example, uh, which I'll come back to that in a moment. But uh, the question, next slide, please. Uh, next click. Uh, the question is that we are facing a peak soil situation, and we do have endangered soil, and already many soils are extinct they have lost their identity. The top soil horizon, the A and B may have been done by soil erosion. So the concept that we apply to animals also applies to the soil as well. The next slide. The soil degradation caused by extractive farming practices leads to depletion of soil organic matter content nutrients, decline in soil structure, loss of soil resilience, decline in ecosystem services and functions, loss of soil biodiversity, leading to hunger, malnutrition, political unrest, civil strife, war and security, having 82.4 million refugees in 2020. This is a vicious cycle. So soil degradation is a cause of political instability and refugees. And I do not need to mention where the refugee problems and how political stability has been affected. I think that's a very serious issue. Everybody knows about it, but this link cannot be denied. Therefore, where the people are leaving home, we want to make sure that that soil is in a capacity, good health to support them, which at the moment is not. Thank you. Next slide, please. The wildlife decline, uh, extinction of species, uh, the report that uh, uh, Geological Society of London other have indicated a very, very serious uh, concern of the agricultural practices. So tremendous dependence on fertilizer, pesticides, irrigation, severe soil degradation, loss of biodiversity, global warming. These are some of the ramifications of the agricultural and other anthropogenic activities. Next one. And yet, in spite of all that, the global food insecurity exists. Please continue. For example, the number of undernutrition people at the end of uh, 2020, 700 million. COVID-19 increased the number by another 80 to 130 million. Malnutrition, deficiency of vitamin, protein affecting 2 billion people. So in spite of all that, the next slide, uh, we have not addressed the global food situation. It seems that uh, globally about 700 million people food insecure. Now their number will increase to more than 800 million by 2030. 2030 is when the sustainable development goal says zero hunger. And half of that number is clearly going to be in sub-Saharan Africa and one third also in South Asia. So by 2030, the sustainable development goal number two 
of zero hunger will not be met. The next slide. And I think I would like to mention that the reason sustainable development goals, not only just number two, but others are not being met, similar to the Millennium Development Goals and similar to the Agenda 21, soils have not focused prominently in implementation of these goals. And I regret to say that as of now, as of today, the soil does not appear among the coalition being put forward for the Secretary General's attention for 23rd of September uh, in UN Food System Summit as well. Therefore, whether the UN Food System Summit without soil will achieve their target, I have question mark about it. The other point that I like to mention is that human health is a fingerprint of soil health. And I was listening to the panel discussion before they talked about the soil health issue considerably. Therefore, the soil health can be improved by restoration of degraded, polluted, and contaminated soil. And restoration and management of soil functionality, physical, chemical, biological, ecological, is critical to advancing many sustainable development goals. One, which end poverty, number two, zero hunger, 13, climate action, 15, land degradation, neutrality, and many others. And they are not on track. Next one, please. Next slide, please. We are already using 40% of the earth's terrestrial surface for agriculture. 77% of agriculture land is allocated raising animals. 70% of the global freshwater withdrawal are used for irrigation. 30 to 35% of the global greenhouse gas emissions are directly and indirectly contributed to agriculture. And yet, one in 11 person is hungry, two to three, seven are malnourished, and that hunger problem has been aggravated because of the disruptions by COVID-19. So business as usual is not an option. Next one. Something is not right. And one other part which uh, need to be mentioned that the health of soil, plants, animals, people, environment, ecosystem, and planetary processes is one and indivisible. This statement, by the way, the health of soil, plants, animals, people is one and indivisible was presidential lecture of Sir Albert Howard in 1920 when he was president of the Indian Science Academy. At the UN Food System Summit, there is a quite a lot of confusion about this. And the confusion is that people like me talk about this one health concept, going from soil all the way to planetary processes. There are others who simply stop at soil, um, at, uh, at uh, animal human health connection. That's kind of a veterinarian type of meditation, you know, how the animals are source of diseases. So biomedicine as one medicine, the real concept as Sir Albert Howard put forward, health of soil, plants, animal, human environment, and planetary processes is the one that needs to be addressed. John Muir said the same thing, when you try to lift anything, you find it's a hit to everything else in the universe. And that's exactly what it means. Thank you. Next one, please. So we need a paradigm shift. More than 30% of the ice free land is used for agriculture, 30% degraded and depleted, 3.75 giga hectare of agriculture land is used for raising animal, 70% percent of fresh water with dry juice for irrigation, 30 percent of greenhouse gases, yet people are hungry and malnourished. Thus, there's a time for a paradigm shift. And that is to bring the one health concept, the health of soil, plants, animal, people, environment, and the planetary processes is one and indivisible. Thank you. Next one. Regenerative agriculture is talked about. By the way, regenerative agriculture is one of the coalition being proposed by the UN Food System Summit along with agroecology. I do not know how can regenerative agriculture and agroecology be implemented without including soil health, but that's right, the way it is now. I hope to change. But what is the regenerative agriculture? It's inspired by eco-innovation. 
powered by non-carbon energy, driven by a circular economy and green infrastructure, and supported by the decarbonization of the terrestrial biosphere at the bedrock of sustainable development. The key is recarbonization of the terrestrial biosphere, putting carbon back in the soils and trees. Remember 555 gigaton that we have lost since the beginning of agriculture. How to put it back, at least some of it. The next one slide, please. It, therefore, the 21st century green revolution, rather than input-based, it must be soil-based, based on soil resilience, ecosystem-based, based on eco-efficiency, knowledge-based, science and management-driven. The idea is to be able to save some land and water for nature. Contrary to the general conclusion by many, even many development organizations, we need more land and water to feed people. Absolutely not. We must use what we have properly, judiciously, prudently, and not waste. Next slide, please. The soil life nexus. The soil is a living entity. Uh, Charles Kellogg said essentially all life depends on soil. There can be no life without soil and no soil without life. They have evolved together. And I like to go a step further. A rhizosphere, the soil root interface and nanoscale is the only place in the universe which has the divine powers to resurrect death into life. Soil is a living entity indeed. And as a living entity, it must be respected as a living being. That means it must have its own rights, not to be, not to be used in any way uh, that will damage its life supporting capacity. The next one. Soil organic matter content is a very important component that provides soil capacity for living. And the optimum soil organic matter content is probably somewhere about three to three and a half percent. And many degraded cropland soils of the world including the developing countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, in the Caribbean region, the Andean region, the organic matter content roots in is less than 0.5%. In fact, I know many soil, it's 0.1%. Therefore, uh, the use efficiency of inputs, even when you put them, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, lime, um, improved varieties, irrigation, their productivity, their efficiency is completely uh, jeopardized, degraded, uh, very little indeed. And uh, it can be improved by improving soil organic matter content. The next one. The next slide, please. For example, I monitored, uh, collected uh, data from my own experiments and many others. If you, in a depleted soil, increase soil organic matter content by one metric ton in the root zone, with the same inputs, uh, how much additional yield can be expected based on the global literature, 100 to 300 kilogram of maize, 20 to 50 kilogram per hectare of soybean, wheat, 20 to 70 rice, all crops. And at the same time, you reduce the need for inputs. And developing countries alone, one ton increase in carbon stock in all cropland soils of the developing country will increase production food a 30 million ton per year. And if you can put in 10 tons or depleted um, soil receiving additional 10 ton of organic matter content, that would have a tremendous impact on soil health, use efficiency, productivity, and nutritional quality. Remember the nutritional quality of the grain. And that's what uh, nutrition sensitive agriculture means. Next one, please. Next slide, please. So the carbon-based fertilization, the focus normally is NPK. I think we should have a slogan, CNPK. If C comes before NPK, the need for NPK will decrease over time because of more recycling, better soil structure, more water conservation, lesser erosion, better biotic activity, many things. I think the slogan should be CNPK. The next one, please. There are uh, large yield gaps, for example, in Africa and the world average yield of rice paddy, you notice the difference. I think that's primarily due to soil health. 
although many people will also say also due to fertilizer and irrigation true but soil health is degraded very tremendously the next slide we have a similar uh, difference in the yield of corn between the world average and the sub-saharan africa uh, once again this can be tremendous so what i'm trying to say is rather than expanding the land area let's try to bridge that yield gap through better management of soil health uh, here are next slide i show a picture of um, the yield difference between rice wheat and soybean between china and india uh, while you notice they were the same about uh, uh, 70s and 60s uh, and they are now very far apart of course china does use different fertilizer but since 1980 they are not using crop residue for cooking and other purposes and dung is also not used for those purposes most of it is going uh, on the land so the soil health in china in general in organic matter content biotic activity since 80s is tremendously improved and india need to catch up we are still taking away the crop residue in india and therefore very large yield gap between those two countries so what i'm trying to say is rather than expanding horizontally uh, vertical expansion through better soil health is a better option next one please urbanization is another issue based on average of 10 largest cities in the world and by the way there are 30 cities or more already which are mega cities more than 10 million people uh, it takes 25 to 30 thousand hectare per million people and annual increase in population is about 81 million so therefore it takes 4 million hectare of best cropland under urban encouragement but also the next slide uh, also these mega cities of uh, uh, their number is increasing there are only three in 75 16 in 2000 uh, at the moment the number is about 31 and this number will be 50 by 2050 and 83 by 2100 the largest city in 2100 will be lagos nigeria with a population of 85 million and a city of 10 million people require 6,000 tons of food a day. So not only the nutrients are coming into the city and not going back where they came from, but they're also a liability because of not proper disposal. We must think in future to grow at least certain percent of green grocery, at least if nothing else, uh, food 20% maybe, 25%, 30% within the city limit by recycling the water and nutrients brought in from the food. And that is a sustainable cities, part of the sustainable development goal. I hope uh, we can meet. And that's where the soil less agriculture, the next slide please, may be also very uh, important solution. Soil less agriculture mean uh, glass houses in the cities, skyscrapers, and many of them are coming up in the large cities at the moment also. Aquaculture, aquaponics, hydroponics, aeroponics, aeropharm. So that we can save the soil for many other uses that we even do not know. Rather than uh, destroy them and contaminate them and pollute them. Keep some of these soils protected for other uses. Such as antibiotics for humans. And the biodiversity. And uh, nature conservation ecosystem services and this is the major reason to return some land back to nature next one how do you meet the next uh, food demand by 2050 honestly i think we are already producing enough food to feed 10 billion people we waste 30 to 50 percent across the board both in developed and developing countries we must increase access of the food by alleviating poverty, inequality, wars, political instability, and refugees. We must improve distribution. We should encourage population through education to consume more plant-based pulses and probably alternate sources of proteins. Accept personal responsibility of not taking food for granted. And we must increase agronomic productivity from existing land restore degraded lands, increase biological nitrogen fixation by legume and converting some agricultural land for nature conservancy without any conversion of natural land to agriculture ecosystem through sustainable eco-intensification, through 
restoration of soil health. So I am completely against bringing more land. I think we did must we must return some land back to nature. The idea is to reconcile the need for advancing food and nutrition security with the absolute necessity of improving the environment, making sustainable soil and agriculture a solution to environment, not a problem. Solution to it. How can it be a problem? We all depend on three meals a day. A source of meals, a problem, it has to be a solution. Next slide. So how do you do eco-intensification? The strategy produce more food from less land, less water, less fertilizer and pesticide, less use of energy, less emission of gases, and save land for nature. Return land back to nature. I have taken a bold step of saying out of 5.2 billion hectare by 2100, return half of it back to nature. Use the existing land properly and do not waste food. Food waste is a crime against nature. How can you justify producing more when you're wasting more? How can you justify bringing more land under cultivation when we degrade it so much? Wake up. Let's build science-based agriculture and do the reverse the trend. Next slide, please. Technological innovation to, to do that are many between 2020 and 15. 2050, recarbonization of the soil and biosphere on my agenda number one, pro-nature agriculture, saving land for nature, climate resilient agriculture, eco-intensification, rhizospheric processes and phytobiome management, robotic and soil-less agriculture, urban agriculture, sky farming, space farming, soil processes under hypergravity, nutrition sensitive farming, precision agriculture, the nexus approach, Farming soil with plants that emit molecular based signals for more sensing and targeted intervention, and of course, farming carbon. You can buy and sell carbon. Farming carbon would create another income stream for farmer. And don't forget the one health concern. Going back to Sir Albert Howard, the health of soil, plants, animal, people, ecosystem, and the planet is one and indivisible, not just the health of animal and people. The whole thing and that would give us the idea of bringing some land back to nature next one the global rates of carbon sequestration i have taken some data from dr david paulson uh, he published quite a lot of good data sometimes he doesn't think the rate of carbon sequestration soil is enough but i if i take his data and the upper two lines are his data these are excellent rates. I never had any rates more than that. If we can achieve these rates in sub-Saharan Africa that he published and reported, wow, we are doing very good. West and Post came up uh, about 20 years ago, very similar rate, 0.57 megagram when you convert from PT to NT. The next slide, please. The technical potential of carbon sequestration in all soils of the world is about two and a half gigaton of carbon per year. Between 2020 and 2100, several of us uh, got together, Pete Smith, myself, a colleague from Germany, China, India, Brazil, etc., to calculate the technical potential of what can be done between now and 2100. Soils can put back 180 gigaton of carbon, 178. Vegetation, another 155. Total, 333. That's equivalent to an atmospheric drawdown of CO2, 157 parts per million. Even if we can do half of that, that's a remarkable success. And if we can find by 2030 and beyond no fossil fuel energy sources, no carbon energy sources, and we can recarbonate the soil and the biosphere, climate change within 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade is still a reality. It can still be done, but we must find no carbon fuel sources. If that's the case, then soil carbon and terrestrial carbon sequestration is a bridge to the future. It's a very important bridge. And how do we implement it? Next slide, please. Rewarding farmer for ecosystem services. Emission trading. 
uh, EU has a better option of what they can be paid. And I took this example from Reuters yesterday. This survey by the International Emission Trading Association found members expect carbon prices in the EU to average 47 euro, 57 dollar per ton between 2021 and 2025. And beyond that to 2030, maybe 58 euro per ton. Last year, survey predicted an average price of 31 euro per ton. Average global carbon price needed by 2030 to put the world back on track to meet the goals of the curb temperature to within the one and a half degree, about 63 euro. I'm many times told, where will this money come from? We have a lot of money going to subsidies right now, redirected to the proper use, payment for ecosystem subsidy to the farmer, for improving soil health, saving land for nature and putting carbon in the trees and soil and pay them properly. Next one. My calculation for carbon sequestration, which I published in 2040, was $130 per ton of C. That comes to about $35 per ton of CO2. About uh, uh, six cents per pound, if you want to put in a pound weight. If a farmer squatter half a ton of carbon per hectare, they should be given $65 per hectare or $26 per acre. Or if it's a one third of a ton, $43 per hectare. It is undervaluing carbon resource and paying them eight or ten dollar instead, four times the price which they should get, will and have, and continue to do so. Tragedy of the commons. And the tragedy of the commons is soil will keep degrading, carbon in atmosphere will be kept emitting, and the global warming will not stop. Pay farmer properly, judiciously, transparently, adequately. Next slide, please. Reducing land area is the data of 700 million hectares right now under cereal production. Rather than increasing, they should decrease the land area under cereal to about 600 million hectares by 2050, 500 million hectares by 21. Total fertilizer used 200 million tons right now. It should come down to half by 2100, certainly reduced by one third by 2050. Irrigated land area can go up, but the water consumption can go down through drip irrigation. The flood irrigation must be banned everywhere. And yet the crop yield can go up of the cereals from 3,300 kilograms to as much as 5,000 kilograms 2050 and 7,000 kilograms by 2100. So uh, this is the way to use the best and save the rest for nature. Next slide, I did the similar calculation in the next slide, please, for India, where uh, we have irrigated land area 70 million hectare and using 200 kilometer cube of water for flood irrigation. That water can be reduced tremendously over time and yet increase the area. Fertilizer used in India, 30 million tons right now, can re be reduced to 15 million tons. Crop residue burning, 100 million tons. By 2030, must be zero if not before that. Pesticides are used 56,000 tons. Reduce over time, maybe half by 2050, and yet the cereal yield should be doubled. Post-harvest losses right now for grains 34%. By 2030, no more than 10%. Fresh fruit and vegetable loss in India, 50%. No reason there should be more than 20%. And organic manure used 200 million tons should be gone up by 50% by 2030, double by 2050, and more than double, two and a half times by 500. Recycle. That does not mean you cannot use chemical. Yes, judicious use is okay. The difference between remedy and poison is a dose and time of application. Apply dose properly and at the right time and as a supplemental along with soil health, and that should be fine. Next slide, please. The last slide I want to mention that soil degradation and desertification, anthropogenic climate change and related extreme events, pathologic agronomic droughts and attendant heat waves, low agronomic yield and perpetual hunger and marginal living and desperateness are major threat to global peace and stability and they require policy intervention to stop them. 
So soil degradation is a cause of political instability. The COVID-19 pandemic has unfortunately aggravated that problem. And solution lies in soil health. UN Food System Summit is still time. Two more weeks. Let's put this word soil health as a part of the agenda. Otherwise, the UN Food System Summit will go the same track at the Sustainable Development Goal. Thank you so much. I'll be glad to answer any question. Person, it, now you would be hearing lots of people clapping. Uh, so uh, you just have to imagine that that's happening uh, at the moment. But yeah, thank you for a very uh, thought-provoking talk. So. Um, Dan has been kindly monitoring the questions, so I'm just going to hand over to Dan now to, to take us through this next part. Thank you, Sasha. And uh, yes, wonderful talk, Dr. Lau. Um, I've got lots and lots of questions here, but um, time will limit me to only select some of them. So select the best and, and save the rest, as, as your talk said. Um, one of them here is uh, in your diagram earlier on in your presentation, Dr. Lau, you showed soil health, plant health, animal health, human health, environmental health, and, and ultimately planetary health. The question then we have is, do you see a need to change this order with human health at the culmination at the end? Um, that has been a question being brought up many times in the World Food System Summit, both in the Science Committee, uh, in Action Track 1, Action Track 3, and I was surprised uh, when they were, many of the colleagues, very knowledgeable, uh, much more so than I am in uh, human and animal health, but they were limited as uh, human health and animal health are interconnected. And uh, so their one health concept, one medicine concept was just that. And when I said, look, I follow what Sir Albert Howard said, 100 years ago, the health of soil, plants, animal, people is one and indivisible. And we have extended that concept to ecosystem and planetary. Pro that is the holistic one health approach. And soil health, if it is degraded, soils are depleted of micronutrients, 17 of them. There's a protein deficiency, micronutrients like iron, uh, zinc, molybdenum, copper, especially iron. Um, the uh, anemic uh, situation in children and young mothers. Uh, and when soil does not have these elements, uh, they do not get it. So I think the healthy food comes from a healthy soil. And healthy soil must have a proper balance of organic and inorganic constituents to support biotic, uh, meso, macro, micro activity. Uh, total living biomass about five tons per hectare, uh, and that link is very critical. Uh, and I, I, I think we cannot overemphasize that part. So the um, vitamins and other things should not come from pills. They must come from uh, healthy food grown on a healthy soil, and that is the mantra. Uh, good soil equal to good food is equal to good diet is equal to good health. And good environment. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, this is a this is a question actually came up earlier, but I, I thought I'd save it actually because with your career, Dr. Lau, uh, with all due respect, you, you've seen soil science change over so long. So the question is: Few soil scientists nowadays are trained in soil science in in pedology. Do you think that this has an, an impact on the ability for us to conserve soil health for uh, for the next generation? Uh, that's a very nice question. I think there is a definitely need to um, bring and attract best and the brightest in soil science uh, because I, I think soil science has been uh, ignored. Uh, I think going back to 70s and 80s, uh, there are not even the faculty member as much as we used to have. Here is my concern. You have a graduate in medical science or graduate in um, uh, IT technology. Or you have a graduate in engineering, you have a graduate in uh, uh, computer science, and then you have a graduate in soil science and agriculture. Have you ever tried to compare their salaries? I, I haven't, no, but uh, Tremendous, different? Mm. tremendous difference. Not a yeah. difference of 5-10%, it's a 2-3 to three times difference. 
therefore when society does not value the education in soil science that they cannot be given a respectable salary how can we attract the best and the brightest yeah so your and message is, is equality in the system then. society understands that if you do not have a healthy soil if you do not have qualified people to maintain soil health and management uh, the health of human the planetary process everything is jeopardy and yeah, therefore absolutely. the soil health uh, depends on what we can reward professionals in soil health don't treat them second class citizen no i know the others deserve the highest income and salary but there is no justification for not treating soil scientists and agriculturists and other dealing with natural processes as a second class citizen that's a policy issue that's an education issue that is something which has to change uh, full provoking work uh, words there dr lao to uh, to end our, our question and answer session thank you so much uh, for that the time is is always slipping past with there's loads loads of questions that i could have pitched thank you to all, to the, uh, all those who, who sent those in but uh, for now i need to pass back to sasha for the uh, the rest of the conference sasha Thank you, Dan. Um, so just let me once again thank Ratan for a fantastic uh, president's invited lecture. Um, pay rises for soil scientists, I'm sure will chime with all of our, our members on the call at the minute. So uh, thank you once again for, for your talk. Um, and uh, and uh, just remind me to thank Dan again for, for handling the questions. Thank you. So um, as we come to the, end of the scientific part of the programme, um, I'd just like to thank on behalf of the Society all of our speakers today. That's Jim, Elizabeth, Matthias, Felicity and Ratan. Um, absolutely superb talks, I'm sure all of you will agree. Um, and uh, I think that the, the topic of soil health is one that's not going to go away and it was really great to get these different perspectives and insights today. Um, I need to thank our sponsors, Arcadis, um, uh, for uh, sponsoring our event today. Uh, and also to Matt for presenting earlier and, uh, and giving the, the business perspective on soil health, which we really appreciate. Um, thank you to all of the delegates for attending today. Um, you'll find a quick survey um, at the end to give feedback on the, on the webinar um, when we get to the end of our AGM, which is just coming up. Please do fill that in. We always look at that and it's very useful for helping us shape future events. Um, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know that the recording of today's event will eventually be hosted on our YouTube channel. So please um, tell your friends and colleagues about this and, uh, and, and share and let them know what great talks that they've missed. So hopefully they can attend our future meetings. Um, and please stay on, on the call now for, for our AGM because we need as many members to support um, us to carry out our, our statutory business for the society. So um, I'm just about to hand over to Bruce. One last thing. Uh, next year, World Congress of Soil Science in Glasgow. Can't wait for it. Really look forward to seeing as many of you there, hopefully in person. So thank you very much. And I will now hand over to Bruce. Brilliant. Thank you, Sasha. Just checking everyone can hear me again. Yeah, I can hear you fine, Bruce. Um, yeah, look, thank you. And uh, can I take this opportunity to thank you as well for chairing today's conference so successfully. I think it's been absolutely Fantastic. Uh, and thank you also to Dan for his support with uh, monitoring and asking the submitted questions.